Percy and the Brake Van, written by Christopher Audrey, featuring Luca Dollar. One day, Percy was standing at the junction. He had a long goods train which he was taking to Timoth, but he had to wait for Henry to pass with a passenger train before he could go on. Henry was late, but the sun was warm and Percy didn't mind. At last, Henry arrived. I'm sorry I'm late, he panted. I had to wait ages for the connection at the other railway. Do you know that they have goods trains on the other railway that don't have brake vans? It doesn't seem right, does it? You've still got yours, I'm glad to see. Ah, there's the signal. I must try and make up a bit more lost time. Goodbye. And he puffed importantly away. Percy told his driver what Henry said about brake vans. His driver laughed. Good trains on the other railway have special brakes, he explained. Like passenger trains and Henry's flying kipper, they don't need brake vans. Your trucks have couplings, so they need brakes at each end of the train in case a coupling snaps. You know how stupid trucks are. They did it to James on Gordon's Hill, remember? Pooh! I know how to keep my trucks in order. What's good enough for the other railway is good enough for me. I don't need a stupid brake van. Don't be silly, Percy, said his driver. Percy took no notice. It would have been better if he had. A few days later, Percy was shunting trucks at the harbor near the big station. He was just completing his train by backing onto the brake van when the shunter's attention was distracted. The shunter thought he had coupled the brake van to the train, but he hadn't. The guard blew his whistle, and Percy set off quickly, hoping to get a run at the hill leading to the main line. But the guard and his brake van were left behind. The guard waved and shouted, but Percy didn't hear. He was too busy climbing the hill. All might have been well if Percy hadn't started so quickly. What's good enough for the other railway is good enough for me. Unfortunately, the jerk had weakened one of the couplings. As Percy snorted up the hill, the weight of the loaded trucks dragging behind the weak coupling broke it. The last four trucks began to run back down the slope towards the harbor. The guard was standing on the veranda of the brake van, and he saw the trucks coming. Quickly, he ran to his brake handle and checked that it was fully on. Then he jumped clear. He was just in time. The trucks hit the brake van with a resounding crash. The van shuddered and was pushed along the line, but somehow it stayed on the rails, and the truck's mad rush was halted. Meanwhile, Percy's firemen had noticed that they had lost the tail end of their train. Percy came slowly back down the hill to see what had happened. Phew, remarked Percy's driver as they helped to clear the mess. You see, Percy? Brake vans do have their uses after all. And Percy had to admit that his driver was right. Old Square Wheels Written by Christopher Audrey The Fat Controller had borrowed a new engine called Diesel from the other railway. He told Duck to show him around, but Diesel had made mistakes, and the trucks began singing cheeky songs about him. <laughs> That's so in the old with Diesel. Show the what I can do. Daily post the Diesel. In and out he beats about. Like a big black weasel. When he pulls the wrong trucks out, pop goes a Diesel. <laughs> Duck was cross when he found out, and told the trucks to stop, but Diesel thought the song was Duck's fault. I'll pay him out, he said to himself, but he couldn't think how. Later, he convened with the three big engines. It's not fair. I never get a moment's peace from these trucks, and it's all because of that Duck. Nonsense. Duck would never do that. It would be dis... dis... Disgraceful. Disgusting. Despicable. Diesel was not convinced, 
and spent the rest of the day wondering how he would get his own back. The next day, Henry's trucks chattered amongst themselves and paid no attention to him. They were full and wanted to take it out on someone. Why not Henry? They whispered to each other. Wait until I give the word, said the front truck. At last, the signal went down. Come on, you! Henry ordered shortly. Reluctantly and still chattering, the trucks followed them out of the yard. All went well until they reached the top of the hill. Steady? Steady? Henry warned to the trucks. They heard, but they took no notice. Shouted the front truck. Go on! Go on! Go on! Go on! Go on, go on, go on, go on <laughs> yelled the trucks as, surging against Henry's tender, they pushed as hard as they could. Stop! Stop! wailed Henry, and his driver braked as hard as he dared. But Henry couldn't hold the heavy trucks properly. His wheels locked and he slithered out of control down the hill with the stupid trucks cheering and shouting behind him. Help! Help! Thomas, waiting in the branch line platform, saw Henry coming, but could do nothing to help. But the hill ended before reaching the station, and Henry was at last able to bring the silly trucks under control. Gradually, his driver eased out the brakes. When he was sure that the trucks were behaving themselves, Henry came to a controlled stop. Phew, he said at last. What stupid things trucks are. They could have caused a serious accident. Never mind that, Henry, said Thomas. They didn't, and that's the main thing. You did well to stop them in the end. Henry could only agree as Thomas puffed away. After a while, Henry set off again. But something strange seemed to have happened to his wheels. Each time they went round, there was a clunk when they reached a certain spot. <sighs> What's that now? He asked after a while. I hate to say this, old boy, but it looks like you got a flat tire, said the driver. What? Engines don't get flat tires. Only cars and lorries or buses like Bertie get them. His driver laughed. It's the truck's fault, he explained. All that slowing on the hill with your wheels locked in the same place has worn a flood place on each of your driving wheels. You'll have to go to the works, I'm afraid. They clung to the end of the line, and Henry went crossly to the shed. Duck was there when he arrived. What's the matter with you, Henry? Asked Duck. Have those trucks been playing you up? Yes, they have. They pushed me down the hill, and our driver says I've got flat tires. Ah, said Duck. Bumpy, that misfortune there. It just goes to show that you can't trust trucks all the time now, can you? Ah, well. I hope you get your flat sorted out. And he puffed off to see about his next train. Unbeknownst to them, Diesel was in the shed sniggering to himself. He just had an idea on how to pay Duck out. The next day, he spoke to the trucks. That was a good trick you played on, Henry. He's got flat tires now, and has gone to the works to have them replaced. Diesel paused impressively. I really shouldn't tell you this, but I know you won't pass it on. Do you know Duck's new nickname for Henry? Oh, Square Wheels. Good, isn't it? Don't tell anyone I told you. The trucks promise, but as Duck had said, you cannot trust trucks. 
When Henry came back from the works, the whisper went round. Hi, hi, huh? It's old square wheels. Huh? Yeah, look, old square wheels is back. <laughs> As Diesel had expected, it was only a matter of time before the trucks told Henry that Duck had invented the nickname. <laughs> oh, I'll give him Duck. Henry said furiously. Just wait till I see him again. The truck sniggered, and Diesel smirked with satisfaction. Well, that worked better than I thought, he said to himself. Now then, what can I think up about Gordon? Edward Cracks a Nut, written by Christopher Audrey. It was early in the evening as Edward stopped at the last station before the junction. He was looking forward to getting home after a long and busy day. Get in quickly, please, he whistled to the passengers. The passengers got in quickly, and Edward's driver pulled the lever. But Edward found that he couldn't move. The driver clambered down and checked Edward's brakes, but nothing seemed to be wrong. I just don't understand. Whatever can be the matter? The driver gave Edward more steam. This time, he started. But Edward only went a little way before he stopped with a groan. Ah. <sighs> It's no good, the driver said to the fireman. Something is holding us back. Go and see if the guard can help us, please. The fireman jumped down to the platform and ran along towards the guard's van. What's going on? demanded the guard. Why haven't we left yet? Don't know, said the fireman. We reckon the brakes have seized on. Are yours off all right? It should be, replied the guard. He reached over and tried to turn the handle, but it wouldn't move. The firemen helped, but working together, they still couldn't turn it. So they called the driver, but even with three, it made no difference. The brake handle was stuck fast. The driver sighed worryingly. <sighs> this is terrible. If we don't start soon, we'll miss our connection with Henry at the junction. Well, what do you suppose we do? Asked the fireman. Hmm, it's risky. But I say we give Edward everything he's got and try and hope for the best. It'll be hard work, but I'm sure you'll do well to make up for lost time, old boy. <sighs> I'll give it my best, sir. But secretly, Edward has doubts all the same. Come on! Come on! Come on! With smoke and steam pouring from his funnel, the train moved slowly after him. Once they were moving, things became easier. Edward found that he couldn't go fast, no matter how hard he tried. Oh dear, oh dear. At this rate, we're sure to miss Henry's train. Come on, come on, come on! <sighs> then, with a sudden jerk, Everything became easy, and Edward began to pick up a brisk pace. <laughs> well now, let's not dilly-dally here, lads. Let's get a move on!
long last, they reached the end of the junction quickly. And while the passengers transferred to Henry's train, Edward's fireman went to find out what had been wrong with the guard's brake. Cousin is a bit close, aren't we, Edward? <sighs> Wasn't my fault, Henry. Honest. We had a bit of a delay with... One tiny nut! Huh? That's what caused this mess from the start. It broke and jammed itself against the brake so that we couldn't turn the handle. Then after we started, the brake itself broke so that we can move properly. Well, that's a relief. The driver laughed as he turned to the old engine. I guess the coaches will be due in for another maintenance check. Ah oh well, come on Edward, let's get that guard's van into a siding out of the way. Right away, sir. <laughs> well, I never. Who would have thought that one small nut could have caused so much trouble? Post Early for Christmas Written by Christopher Audrey Featuring Electra Gamer, Tommy Bauer, Crane Engine Studios, and Bad Rider Illumini The winter holidays were always a joyous occasion on the island of Sodor. Christmas is coming and all the letters, cards, and parcels posted from Farquhar were carried along Thomas's branch line to the sorting offices up at Tidmouth. This year, however, the trains became heavier and heavier. One day, about a week before Christmas, the people at the post office in Farquhar asked for a special train that evening. The station master agreed and arranged for Percy to take it in the morning. Around lunchtime, the sky clouded over thick and heavy from the east. It began to snow, not hard at first, but by tea time, it had turned into a blizzard. Just my luck having to go out again in this weather! Percy grumbled shivering amongst the cold. I'd much rather be in my nice warm shed! <sighs> Wouldn't we all? Sympathized Toby. If it were any colder than it is now, my frames and bell would surely end up coming off. The driver, however, was having none of it. Don't go getting into a tizzy, old boy. Orders are orders, and you wouldn't want the children missing their presents on Christmas Day just because you'd rather stay in the shed, would you? Percy could only sigh in agreement, knowing his driver was right. Soon, his crew fixed a snowplow to his front buffer beam. When all the mail in sacks and packed in big metal trolleys had been loaded onto the train, Percy set off down the line. Rather to his surprise, the snow wasn't too bad. The tunnel was usually the worst place in the snow, but they reached it without trouble. Percy whistled cheerfully as they passed Mrs. Kindly's cottage, but nobody waved in reply. Crimson red curtains were sensibly drawn against the weather, and a warm glow of the light shone through them onto the snow outside. We'll be alright now, said the firemen as they came safely out into the valley, but he was wrong. They passed the station by the river all right, but they found in the open land lower down the valley that the snow had drifted more deeply. Before they reached the station by the airfield, they realized they could go no further. By now the snow was level with Percy's buffers, and a sharp wind was blowing snow off the sides of the cutting to pile up around him. Oh dear, this doesn't look too good. Quickly Percy. We got to get back to the station, or else we'll get stranded here. But it was too late. 
Already, the snow was so thick around Percy's wheels that they just spun helplessly and didn't move him. Not even an inch. <sighs> well, that's done it. Bess head back to the station to tell them what's happened. The driver told the fireman. Thank goodness there aren't any scheduled trains or passengers to worry about. No, grumbled the fireman. Only me. You didn't say I need snowshoes, did you? Once the guard was informed of the fireman's situation and where he was going, he walked up to Percy's cab a little while later to be near the fire. Make the most of it, remarked the driver with a grin. We can only keep it going however long the cold and water lasts. When the firemen reached the station, they held a conference meeting in the station master's office, but the staff wasted no time in sending for help. They thought of sending Thomas or Toby up from Farquhar, but then realized that the weather had become worse along the far depths of the island. By the time either one could reach him, or any other engine they could get on short notice, the snow would probably be thick enough to strand them just like Percy. Not even engines like Donald and Douglas could force their way through the storm in time, too. Hmm... It's the mail. That's the biggest worry. We can't just leave it stranded out in the snow, said the station master. Suddenly, the firemen remembered something when they passed by the station earlier. Don't they keep part of the airfield clear at all times? Harold the helicopter's here, isn't he? He could take the mail for us up to the big station. We can't do that now! They'd never let him take off in this blizzard! Objected the station master. We'll have to get the clearance for him first thing in the morning. They soon took hot drinks and food down to Percy's driver and guard and later on in several journeys brought sacks of mail up to the station. Arrangements were made early next morning, and Harold wasted no time in taking to the skies when the weather had cleared. He took as many sacks as he could, and kept coming back for more until the mail was cleared. afternoon when the job was finished, and Harold arrived on the scene to see Thomas and Toby pull Percy and his train back to Farquhar safely. Everyone was quick to thank the two engines for the rescue when they got back, but they thanked Harold immensely for his help with the posts. Think nothing of it, old chaps, he replied. I couldn't dare to imagine seeing any sad children on Christmas morning if they didn't receive their presents, now would I? And a good thing too, when help came sooner, said Percy smiling warmly. Now I know what you felt like, Thomas, when you got to collect the treat for the back at George's Christmas party that one year. Thomas couldn't help but laugh <laughs> along with his best friend. At least you got most out of it this time round, Percy, said Thomas. Lucky you kept your fire going until it went out. True enough. <sighs> but to be honest, I don't imagine I'll be doing runs like that again. For all I hope next year, 
Posting early for Christmas can start as soon as it likes. Thomas and the Cricketers, written by Christopher Audrey, featuring Tommy Bauer, Jonathan Asayama, Dark Magical Yoshi, The Sojourney Zero, and Daniel Alsop. A forced hurricane wind swept across the island throughout the evening. Thomas, Percy, and Toby listened anxiously as it rattled against the windows and moaned in the roof of the engine shed. Gradually, the moan rose to a howl. It wasn't long until they heard the sound of a crack and a slithering noise up on the roof as slates broke loose and slid into the guttery. The engines shivered in annoyance as they tried to get some rest. When their crews came to start work the next morning, the engines all looked rather tired as if they hadn't slept for days. <sighs> You know, said Thomas hopefully, it's days like this where I sympathize on being one of those little engines that run along the mountain railway up near Gil Godred. Their trains stop running in case the winds get too dangerous. Percy and Toby couldn't help but agree, as they too didn't want to leave the comfort of their nice warm sheds. Their drivers laughed at this. Sorry, Thomas, replied his driver. To begin with, you weigh more than those little engines, and secondly, winds are usually far worse up in the mountains anyway. Now come on, what would the fat controller say if we went and did something like that? Tell me there. <sighs> Once he was steamed, Thomas hurried off to fetch his train. He soon found that the wind was not only strong, but cold too. Annie and Clarabel didn't like it any more than Thomas did either. At the top station, they grumbled not because of the wind, but because there weren't many pastures along the platform. Thomas didn't blame them for staying at home. He wished he could have done the same. by the river, he was astonished to see white-clad figures playing around a cricket in the field nearby. It's an important match, part of the knockout competition, explained his fireman, who played cricket himself when he had the time. At the end of the season, the winners will get a silver cup, but I don't envy them in this weather though. Trees between the railway and the cricket field swayed and lurched as Thomas ran past. One of the players recognized the fireman, who responded by waving at him. The fireman waved back, but he was glad to be in the shelter of Thomas's cab today. At the junction, James told them about the trouble that the wind caused all over the island. I've heard word from Control that they're providing bus services from Crovens Gate to Vickerstown. What would most of the signals be in faulty and everything? He said to Thomas. They even shut down parts of the main line due to either fallen trees or... Ooh! <laughs> even flying debris that can hit you, even if you aren't going too fast. <sighs> You best just be careful when heading back up the line, Thomas, you hear? After James got signaled off by the guard, a concerned look crossed Thomas's face. <sighs> right then, we better get home as quickly as we can, said Thomas to his crew. They hurried along the line until they reached the mill station safely. Only two passengers got out. While this occurred, the crew were having a tough time fixing the hose pipe along the platform to Thomas's water column, trying to give him a drink.
Once he was filled, Thomas whistled, setting off again. By the time he reached the curve which led around the cricket field, they were going nicely. Come along, come along. He puffed calmly to Annie and Clarabelle. Not far now. At this rate, we'll soon be back in our warm shed. He was halfway around the bend when a flash of white caught his eye. Almost at once, the train's brakes went off as the guards suddenly pulled the emergency cord. With a squeal, Thomas slowed to a stop, but not before he rounded the curve far enough to see a huge tree lying across the tracks. Phew! He exclaimed. That's odd. How did the guard know about this? His driver looked back and saw to his surprise a fleet of cricketers running towards them, followed by the guard. Thank goodness you stopped! panted one of the cricketers. When we heard Thomas's whistle from the station, it was then we saw the tree go and topple over across the line. Lucky your guard saw us trying to flag you down. We thought we were too late and couldn't make it in time. I'm glad we were, however. So are we, remarked the fireman. It was a near miss this has been. Still, thank you for warning us. All of you. After exchanging handshakes with the cricketers, Thomas's crew reversed him back to the mill station, where Bertie arrived to take the passengers home. Since Thomas could go no further until the line was clear, he had to spend a cold night out of the station. He didn't mind him much as he got to see the rest of the cricket match, which the local team won after a close and exciting finish. A few days later at a meeting in the cricket pavilion, the back controller presented the cricketers with a framed certificate to remind them of the day they saved the train. The cricketers were almost proud of this, rather than their cricket trophy. Next year! said the captain of the team. We may have to pass the cricket cup to someone else, but your certificate will always remain here nevertheless.